Turning a three-phase motor on and off with a PLC is easy enough. The PLC enables the contactor and the contactor allows power to flow to the motor. While that does work, it's not very realistic. In most practical applications, there's a whole lot more to it. We'll want to be able to monitor the status of the branch circuit breaker and be able to trip that circuit breaker so we can shut things down remotely and manage loads to make system startup easier. We'll need a button to turn the motor on and we'll want that button to light up while the motor's running. We'll need a way to stop the motor and let's have that button blink red for five seconds while the motor spins down and then turn solid red when it's okay to restart the motor. Of course, we want to be able to monitor the status of the overload and be able to test that it kills the power to the motor when it trips. And finally, we want to be able to reverse the motor and have all the necessary interlocks to ensure we don't change the motor direction while it's powered. And of course, we'll want surge suppression on our contactors to protect our controller from the voltage spikes. That's a little more involved than just turning a motor on and off, but it really isn't that bad. In this video, we'll review how all of this gets wired together, and then in the next video, we'll program an Automation Direct Productivity 2000 controller to monitor and control this AC motor system. At first glance, the wiring looks intimidating, but if we take it one step at a time, it really isn't that bad. Our controller has an input module with eight inputs and an output module with eight relay outputs. We want to use those to control and monitor a three-phase motor on a branch circuit. We'll start with the circuit breaker that provides us the three-phase power. We want to be able to monitor the status of the breaker, so we add an aux contact to the circuit breaker and bring that into input number one. While we could use either the normally open or the normally closed contact here, we prefer to use a normally open contact so loose or broken wires will be detected while the circuit breaker is powered up. This serves as a fail-safe for our circuit and it's a really good habit to get into. We want to be able to trip this breaker remotely, so let's add a shunt trip which will drive from output number one. We can now monitor and control the branch circuit breaker. Check that off the list. Next, we add a contactor. We're using a WEG mini contactor in this demo because they're so easy and convenient to use and they're very capable. They can handle up to 25 amps. We'll control it from output number two and we'll call that the forward direction. We definitely want surge protection, which for this contactor is just a plug-in module, and we want to monitor the status of the contactor, so we'll add an aux contact module with a normally open contact going into input number two. Now, could we have used the built-in aux contact that the WEG contactor has for this? Sure, but we chose this particular contactor with the normally closed built-in contact because it'll make adding reversing easier when we get to that step. So we'll leave that one alone for now and just use the aux contact module to monitor the status of the contactor. Finally, we'll definitely want an overload protector and we'll have the overload reported on the closure of the overload's normally open aux contact into input number four. Remember, the overload doesn't kill the power. It just reports that there's an issue. So we'll use the overload's normally closed contact to kill power to the contactor's coil. We want to use the normally closed contact for this because it's connected when the overload isn't tripped, but also because if there's a loose connection or a broken wire, it'll keep the motor from running. If we use the normally open contact to somehow interrupt the contactor's coil, we wouldn't be able to detect any wiring faults. So use of the normally closed contact helps make the system fail safe. Well, that's all we need to control the motor in one direction. Well, that's not so bad. We can monitor and control the branch circuit breaker, we can enable the contactor, monitor the contactor, protect the PLC from surges, protect our motor against overload, and monitor the status of the overload. Perfect. To add reversing, we just add a second contactor and do two more things to the wiring. First, if the motor is powered through this contactor and rotating in the forward direction, we don't want the reverse contactor to engage. That would short out the wiring and bad things would happen. And likewise, if the motor is going in reverse, we don't want the forward contactor to engage. To fix that, we modify the control wiring a little bit. Instead of controlling the forward contactor directly, we run the control wire through the aux contact on the reversing contactor. So if the reversing contactor is engaged, there's no way the forward contactor can be turned on. We do the same thing for the reverse contactor. Run his control wire through the forward contactor's aux contact. So if the forward contactor is engaged, there's no way the reverse contactor can be turned on. And finally, we need to run a copy of the power lines through the second contactor, taking care to cross one set of wires to get that reversing action. 
The good news is, this wiring is already done for you in these reversing kits. Just plug them in. Some reversing kits require you to do the failsafe wiring yourself. With these WEG contactors we're using, all you need to do is run one wire to each normally closed contact and a single neutral. The failsafe wiring is all built into the bus bars. We also want to monitor the status of the reverse contactor, so we'll add another aux contact to that guy and run that into input number 3. And we'll want to add surge suppression too. We'll also add a mechanical interlock. We already made sure that one contactor can't engage when the other contactor is active by wiring the coils to the other contactor's aux contact. This mechanical interlock does the same thing. When one contactor is engaged, it physically prevents the other contactor's armature from moving. Same function as the wiring, but this time it's purely mechanical. It has an extra layer of protection, and having both electrical and mechanical interlocks is required by some codes. And there you have it, a full reversing AC motor start-stop control circuit with the ability to remotely trip and monitor the breaker, remotely monitor the overload, electrical and mechanical fail-safes built in to protect us from wiring shorts if the controller accidentally tries to engage both contactors at the same time, and overload protection. Keep in mind that this wiring diagram is intended for guidance only. It's your responsibility to ensure that all wiring and installation meets NEC code, UL codes, and any other local agency codes and standards that are required. And while this has fail-safes built in to protect the controller, it does not show how to handle the load end of the system. You need to make sure that you have all the requisite safety relays, e-stops, and whatever else you'll need to ensure that your system will meet the appropriate NEC, UL, and IEC safety standards. Here's a photo of the test rack and all of the parts used in this video. There's a lot of extra wires and connectors on this guy, so we can swap out controller and subject matter panels for other videos, but functionally, it's identical to the wiring diagrams we created in this how-to video. Join us in part two of this video, where we'll write the PLC code to control and manage all of this. If you need more details on any of the items we're using here, check out the companion tech tip videos. They go into great detail on every one of these items. If you have any questions about any of this, please don't hesitate to contact AutomationDirect's free, award-winning tech support during regular business hours. They'll be happy to help you. And check out the forums. There's lots of folks there that love to share their years of experience. Just don't ask any support questions there. They don't monitor the forums on a regular basis.